This giant smelter at Trail British Columbia produced lead, zinc, and other metals for the Allied forces during the Second World War. But the smelter produced something else as well, something far more dangerous. We never knew what it was. No, we didn't even know that we were making it. Jesse wasn't alone. In 1943, no one knew the whole truth about a mysterious tower that stood high above the smelter city on the Columbia River, just a few minutes' drive from the Canada-U.S. border at Patterson, Washington. Codename Project 9. Only one man in trail knew the full story of the secret that was housed inside the 14-story building, and it wasn't just any secret. In fact, it was probably the most important Canadian secret of the entire war. That man was S.G. Blaylock, the influential president of the Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company of Canada, later Cominco. Blaylock kept his secret well, but the presence of U.S. military personnel in nearby Warfield suggested that something strange was unfolding up on the hill. As part of its war production work, Blaylock's company provided chemical products such as sulfuric acid and hydrogen, products that could be used to make bombs, it also produced heavy water, the product Jessie Fennell didn't know she was making. But even if she did know, why was it so important? What was it for? Gordon DeRosa, a former health and safety coordinator for Local 480 of the United Steelworkers Union, also recalls being puzzled by the P9 Tower. When I was six, I moved from East Trail up to Annabelle, which is a community just below the Warfield plant. And uh, <clears throat> there was barbed wire around the perimeter of the plant and with turrets every so often. And I thought that's strange. Six, seven, eight-year-old boy. And used to climb up there and climb over the fence and get up and they had water-cooled uh, machine guns up there. And I thought, why are these all up here? Historian Jeremy Mowat, who has studied Kaminko's history, helps unravel the P9 secret. It's only in 1932 that the first electrolytic hydrogen is produced. And by 1934, um, as they're developing these basically scrubbers and other things to, to pull the sulfides um, uh, out, of the, um, out, of, out of the air before it goes up the stacks, as they're developing these processes, they realize there's gonna be electrolytic hydrogen available, which uh, is a step in producing heavy water, and they alert the federal government. Um, they sort of say, you know, we actually could be producing heavy water here, and our understanding of the literature is this plays a significant role in, in some contemporary research around uh, in, into atomic energy and so on. Ten years later, in 1942, the P-9 Tower was under construction. William Leith, a retired engineer, recalls working in the tower as a summer student. It was simply, uh, there was a gate with several guards that you'd talk to, eh? So you'd go up there and you'd tell them, I'm coming to work in, uh, we would call it, I guess Project 9, what the then building, one of the buildings was right by the gate, well, one of them was at the far end of the lot, eh? So what the thought is, if a bomb came over, they'd probably only go after the large one. Leith didn't know it at the time, nor did Blaylock know its precise purpose, but the new plant would soon be producing heavy water destined for the ultra-secret Manhattan Project. However, as Leith noted in an unpublished paper in 2003, Blaylock was a nuclear pioneer. He knew the difference between fission and fusion. Perhaps he knew more about the purpose of P9 than anyone thought. Blaylock had followed Lord Ernest Rutherford's Nobel Prize winning discovery of radioactivity. In fact, he attended McGill University while Rutherford was there in the late 1890s. He also knew about American scientist Harold Urey's later discovery of heavy water. Enrico Fermi had created the first nuclear reactor by then. 
and Blaylock would have known about the increasing concerns of bomb inventor Leo Zylard. Zylard even circulated a petition to stop the use of the bomb. Not long after the discovery of heavy water was announced in the 1930s, Blaylock assigned a team of Cominco scientists to experiment with Ure's heavy water formula. Aware of scientific warnings from Albert Einstein, Zylard, and others, Blaylock nevertheless negotiated a deal with the U.S. Army that involved trail in the creation of the world's first weapon of mass destruction. But neither Jesse Fennell, nor Gordon DeRosa, nor anyone else in trail was any the wiser. Years later, I found out that there was this tower, this P9 tower, and its purpose was to, to um, produce heavy water for the Manhattan Project. So it was always there in my mind. Um, it was always spoken of. Mm, it was always a mystic thing. Nobody ever spoke about it out front, uh, but it was, it was kind of common knowledge. After the war, Jessie Fennell received a certificate from U.S. War Secretary William Stimson praising her home front role in the war. It was recognition for helping produce the atomic bomb. Jessie was among hundreds and perhaps thousands of trail women replacing enlisted smeltermen during the war. Some, like Jessie, were assigned to the P-9 Tower. She vividly remembers the workplace setting. And one day, we, we just had to walk around and, and we had a big sort of an evaporator thing, you know, and the big evaporators out here. And then at the end of the building, there was a big round thing and there was a, a thing, basin underneath it and it was catching the stuff, drips, drips, all the time. And one day, I was looking at it and I noticed some wet on the floor, so I ran and pulled them off and crawled. People running all over the place. They had cotton batten and they were dipping it all up. So we knew that it was something awfully important. In August 1945, Jesse and all of Trail learned just how important P9 was when the Trail Daily Times revealed the smelter's secret wartime role. They were again reminded of that role in the early 1950s when a young journalist named Pierre Burton hinted in McLean's magazine that communist union leaders at the smelter might be passing atomic secrets to the Soviets. In fact, the union leaders were no more aware than anyone else. Former union president Doug Jones recalls hearing stories about the tower. But people were trying to understand what was going on at the time. That's, that's what I hear. Uh, and, and, you know, um, basically uh, everything that was done was done under such tight security that, uh, you know, people just weren't, other than the workers that went in there and worked, um, I don't think too many people, and I don't know, even know if they knew what was going on particularly. Former Trail Historical Society President Jamie Forbes agrees that P9 workers like Jesse did not know the intended use of heavy water. Still, there was a sense of danger. There was a fear of Japanese attack um, of trail because of the size of the smelter and, and what it was doing to, to uh, support the war effort um, of the British particularly. Um, so uh, they installed a, a siren system, an air raid system, um, that uh, eventually was used for emergency notifications. Initially, the warning siren was the whistle on an armored car called Sea Biscuit that Blaylock had built. It's all pretty much gone now, but uh, um, there was a definite fear in the community that they were subject to attack by particularly the Japanese, the Germans were too far away from, by the Japanese, and uh, so I, I think there probably was that fear, you know, lights out, you know, black in the place, that kind of stuff, yeah. It wasn't until the early 1970s, thanks to local historian Craig Andrews, that Trailites learned more about the real purpose of the P9 Tower. As a young teacher in 1963, Andrews toured the smelter. During the tour, the tour guide pointed out that large building in the area of the plant which is now producing fertilizer. And he, in, in, in passing, mentioned that the plant had been the, the location of the production of heavy water during the 1940s. That massive gray building uh, it was a it was a stark looking thing, and it was uh, much the tallest building in Warfield. 
uh, of the Kaminko plants, and it stood by itself. Andrew's article was published in the CMNS magazine Kaminko, but by the early 2000s, Tech Resources Limited, the new smelter owner, was planning to demolish the P9 tower. But Gordon DeRosa, for one, did not want the smelter city to forget that part of its past. Then a city councillor, he argued against the demolition. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity here. Um, it should be, it, the veil of secrecy should be lifted off this once and for all, taken out of the shadows into the light of day, and make it a, a national heritage site. I thought it would be the respectful thing to do for the citizens of Trail who contributed to the, to the production of, of that, that heavy water. But I, under, I guess they had a good business case to take it down, and they did take it down. Not everyone shared DeRosa's point of view. Trail Mayor Mike Martin, a former Cominco manager, saw no need to preserve the tower. What we should uh, recognize and celebrate, and we did this during the 100-year celebration of tech in this community, was recognizing how we got to where we are today and how the community got here with 100, over 100 years of uh, smelting in our community and how tech contributed to that. And I think the P9 tower it could be just a, a symbol of that, or the P9 experience, if you want. Um, and, and we should just recognize and, uh, and continue to celebrate the fact that we continue to evolve uh, with very highly skilled, highly technical people that help drive the operation. And that's a nice way. I think it was no different back then than it is today. Both Martin and retired Kaminko Communications Director Richard Fish noted that there were practical business considerations that led to the demolition of the tower. However, Fish appreciated the historic value of P9. I don't think we want to lose sight of that. I think it's a really interesting story. And I've read a lot of articles about it, and I know other people who have too. Um, so there's a lot of interest for sure. I, you know, I, from my perspective, I wouldn't mind seeing something more done with it, um, some sort of interpretive center or some such thing. Historical records don't reveal how much Blaylock knew about Project 9's importance in the making of the atomic bomb. But its agreement to support the Manhattan Project is praised even today on a website that records his role. Clearly, Blaylock did what he thought was in the best interest of the country. What isn't so clear is how much real danger Trail might have been in as a result. There was one sabotage plot uncovered early in the war, and there were Japanese internment camps nearby, but aside from a 1946 London Daily Mirror strip suggesting it, there is no evidence of any attempts to destroy the P9 Tower. Jamie Forbes remains puzzled over Tech's decision to destroy the tower. I think it is an important part of the community's history, particularly the smelting industry um, that was around at that time, and I, I find it odd that it's still still being kept, I wouldn't say secret, but they, they don't want any any talk about it or their, well, the previous company role in you know developing the atom bomb. I, like, I'm at a loss to understand after this length of time why they would see that as something that they don't want published. Craig Andrews might also wonder at the reluctance to preserve the tower as a memory of the past. I feel very strongly uh, that, that we need as a, as a human species to be connected to our past. And this is, this, is, this is one way of doing it. I mean, we can't always tell the happy tales. And, and I don't mean to, to think that uh, and I don't think that we can be uh, uh, triumphant and full of stories about heroism and triumphalism, but I think we need to look at the, at the story and tell it as it was, and to the extent that we can. In the end, the heavy water produced at the P9 Tower was never used in the production of the bombs that flattened Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. The plant was deactivated in the mid-1950s after supplying heavy water for many years to Canada's atomic reactor program at Chalk River, Ontario. Today, all that remains of the secret of the P9 Tower and the role it played in building the atomic bomb is a plaque that was erected near where the plant once stood. That and local memories. It, it's, it's a historical 
national treasure in my mind for whatever reason, good or bad. We should be able to review that history, come to our own conclusions, and uh, not destroy what we've done in the past, but learn from it if in fact there's lessons to be learned.